All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Zero Dark Nerdy, the world's most notorious pop culture podcast. The filthiest of the filthy. This is your boy, Brian, a.k.a. El Nino, and today I'm joined with... Ryan Saber, Captain Cleveland, Browns, Cavs, Cleveland baseball team. See you lead till I die. Harry, I love your face there. And we have none other than the CEO... The one and only Harry Arnett in the building joining us today. Harry, Woo! how are you doing from sunny California? I didn't prepare anything. Harry Arnett, a from the ATL, Falcons, Braves, Hawks, uh, just basically any team that has never won a championship. Those are my teams. <laughs> and it's all right, Harry. I think it's good you kicked it off that way. Most people pick on me and make fun of me, so you you slid right in. You're right. You're right in there, man. Okay, good. And Duke University yeah. alumni, correct? Yes, that's right. Yeah, I can't count Duke as winning championship, except I what I grew up like hating Duke sports, hating, right. hating. Like hate's not even a strong enough word. So now, having gone there, now I just sort of am like tolerant of uh, of Duke sports. So the hatred's turned down, but can't can't quite call myself a Duke fan. <laughs> We're in North Carolina, so uh, you just turned off half of our listener base. Right? I, hey, right. I, you know what? They got a lot of good money from me over the time I was there. Whether uh, you love them or you hate them, half of the exactly, people that are listening, exactly, are like, they oh, know it. We know. We know exactly. those of us that went there. We know that half the world hates us anyway. So. <laughs> There you go, Sable. You want to kick us off on this fantastic episode here? Man, I got Harry. Listen, uh, we didn't do a whole lot of intro on this thing off camera. So I'm, I'm going to save, I guess, some of the things that I want to tell. I, I, I've i been looking forward to this interview for weeks, and that's no bullshit. We had Archie Gibbs on a few weeks ago. I told him how much I enjoyed your part of wall street because you know what ryan it sounds a little bit like bullshit so i'm gonna let you go 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 ahead (laughs) no and you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna wait because i got some real hard-hitting stuff to ask you down the road i I guess just let's take a step back and let's talk about you behind the scenes let's talk pre-municipal pre wall street i know that you know from the conversation we had with uh rihanna last week that your background you started at callaway you worked at tailor-made i guess before we kind of get into the show and get into all that stuff i'm just interested about your journey the transition from sort of a big brand to a, a startup what that was like the process how, you know, just everything about that, because I'm fascinated with that. Well, I mean, I could have really used you guys podcast back in the day, because when I was getting out of college, which was a long ass time ago, um, Come on, there wasn't, back. there really wasn't anything that would guide me to what my career was going to be or what I wanted to do. I kind of felt like I didn't want to be behind a desk. I didn't want to be stuck in an office. Office culture to me just seemed so uh, so stifling. I didn't have any any way of really knowing how to how to pursue a career whatsoever. My dad was like very much a self-made guy and invented his own his own job really um, as a curator, collector, author, um, just kind of a, um, a cultural provocateur. I just made that up. How's that sound? I, I like it. A cultural cool. co- provocateur. <laughs> um, and, you know, so like him as a, as a role model in terms of how to live your life didn't give me a whole lot of guidance in what I wanted to do when I got out of college. So my 15 years of my life really after college was spent zigzagging around trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I, I ultimately came to a place that I really just wanted to be a part of a dynamic um, team-based environment, trying to uh, trying to do cool shit. That was basically it. Um, now, nobody lists a job like that. So like, okay, here, we're looking for people that want to be part of a dynamic team-based environment doing cool shit. That, okay, that didn't exist. So I spent, you know, a lot of time kind of 
trying to figure that out, having a bunch of jobs I didn't like, having some that I did, um, really feeling stuck and insignificant a lot of times. And ultimately, um, I ended up going to grad school as kind of a, an inflection point for me to, to really have a credential for, in some ways, to be around a bunch of other young people and figure it out. And um, I'd love to tell you I came out of grad school figuring out that did not happen. So, but ultimately what I ended up realizing is I wanted to, I really wanted to be at a place um, where the, the people there were really passionate about what they did, whether, whether that was a product they were making or a service they were providing. I really wanted to, to be a part of that. And it, it took me a while to find that. And fortunately, um, after, you know, if I actually had to make a resume again, it would have a thousand, a thousand stops along the way. But um, ultimately, that led me out here to California to TaylorMade Golf, who was really emerging at that time in the golf industry as the, the real kind of uh, straw that was stirring the drink and, and innovating, being disruptive as hell. And I really, I love that environment. Um, and I had, I mean, literally, I was there almost six years and I had 18 different jobs or job responsibilities during that time. So like incredibly dynamic place. Um, and that, that, all, that gave, afforded me the opportunity to go work at Callaway. They were going through a turnaround. So they were kind of the opposite. They were a, a really big brand, really well-known brand that had been number one in the category for a long time. It had been known as the innovator. I mean, that if for people that are listening or you guys that are around the sport, they really introduced modern technology to the game. And back in the early 90s with Ely Callaway, who ironically went to my alma mater, my college alma mater, uh, Emory University. But um, a little plug for Emory. Maybe that'll, uh, maybe that'll do something for their rankings. Probably not. Probably not. It probably won't come to think of it. We anyway, it so uh, that, that sent me to Callaway. I was the CMO there for a while. I was the executive vice president um, in charge of kind of a lot of stuff. And um, I loved it there. I had, a, had an awesome time. I just, in the back of my head, probably from my upbringing that I was, I was alluding to earlier, I just had this, this real calling to kind of do something on my own and start something from scratch. And, and honestly, you know, come success or failure, just see if I could do it, honestly. So, uh, so I, I sort of, I sort of burned all the boats and started something, started something with a couple, a couple friends. And, um, we didn't know the pandemic was coming. Did right. anybody know the pandemic was coming? No. Did yeah. anybody pull me aside? <laughs> Brian, Brian, where fact, are you, Brian? It's, Brian it's, I was when it started, about. we thought it was only going to last like two and a half weeks. Right. <laughs> isn't that, isn't that the truth? I mean, I, I just, I remember it so distinctly and you mentioned the wall street show, which of course we're part of, but um when we first started hearing about it because we have we're making products kind of all over the world but some in asia too and that's um dep depending on who your news source is it started there how it started you guys can do another podcast on that who knows yeah. but um we started hearing hey you know what this is a lot different than some of the other pandemics some of the other pandemic some of the other minor pandemics that have been this one is legit. It's shutting down 30 million people, uh, population centers. There are people that are not allowed to leave their homes for weeks. And we were like, fuck, that sounds like legit. But you never really think it's going to affect you, right? Mm -hmm. And um, Until you're and, arm wrestling for toilet paper. Yeah, and then <laughs> I, I just, for me, like where it really hit home as a, as a massive sports fan, was when they they shut down all the conference basketball tournaments and then the NBA like immediately canceled, yep. postponed. But every, we were like, what? We never seen anything like that. Baseball sent everybody home from spring training, and um, and that's that's kind of where I knew. And I remember we were in the office for like, holy shit, this is real. This is this is legit. They stopped the ACC tournament during like during a game. They yeah. came yeah, out like, for warm ups. And then they told them everybody leave and they canceled the entire tournament during a game. Yep. Wild. Right. Yeah. So, um, and I remember my kids coming home and, Oh, we're going to be home for maybe a week or two. This was in March of 2020. And 
my wife and I were talking about, I was like, can they really keep them here at home for the whole rest of March? What the, <laughs> I mean, it's funny to even look back on that. It's crazy. Like, I went back to, so we I went back to the office for the first time last week. I just got a, a new job at the company I'm with. So I switched buildings and I said, you know what? I got to come move my desk and go meet my new boss and da, 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 da. I mean, I went to my, it's clearly, you know, 14 months later, my last day in the office was March 12th, 2020. My first day in the office was June 1st, 2021. So there's obviously a huge gap there. But the week before I went into the building that I was working in to sort of clean up my stuff, it was like the walking dead, Harry. It's a corporate, think corporate setting cube farm, right? Yeah. Everybody's calendars were still on March, 2020. There's like dead plants sitting on people's desks. And I'm just like, man, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. It's like Chernobyl. Like when you see yes. all the, how right. they abandon it. Right. Did you get to steal any good office equipment or anything? No, first? you know, I, I'm, I'm with the same company, you know, oh, so right. I, you, you know, know, you gotta, you gotta kind of. I just, I kind of switched brands. I'm in the heavy duty trucking industry and we have, we have two brands. So I went from, from dual brand responsibility to single brand responsibility. So I, I like, you it. know, it's yeah. You know, anyway, you at least swipe somebody's chair. Come on. Yeah. You got to smell your chair. Just, <laughs> it's still smell bad. Like, I, uh, I, I am not a thief. I am not a thief. <laughs> one, one follow-up question. Be here. And I got one follow-up before yeah, yeah, you ask one. The significance of the municipal brand, where uh, clearly you were involved in the naming convention, I would imagine. Oh, yeah. You know, the, the governing body. I'm just curious how you guys, the, that that board meeting, or you, I'm sure you guys were sitting in a boardroom writing names on the whiteboard, how very that came formal. about. Yeah, you, you nailed it. It was very, very formal process. Um, no, we, we, we started out, I've known... I've known Mark Wahlberg for 10 years and um, I met his partner, Steven Levinson um, along the way too with Mark. And they were, they were always wanting to do something in, um, in the apparel slash fashion space, but that, that never felt big enough to them. And that makes sense. I mean, these guys are the ultimate disruptors. Anything they do, it changes the, it changes the trajectory of whatever category they're, they're involved in. Um, or medium that they're participating in. And they had, um, they had this idea that was like pretty an abstraction more than, than real concrete that, uh, that they wanted, um, they wanted the name to which they had kicked around a bunch of names. One of them was municipal to really reflect a, 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 a very res, resounding grassroots origin of where we all kind of grew up loving our our whatever sport or participation or community that we were a part of. And you know these guys have have had so much success in other things that they but they both they both, share that value of being grounded in never forgetting where they came from and why they, why they did, why they're doing what they're doing to begin with, you know, they, as hyped as their lives are now and they're hyped. I mean, you know, you hang around Mark, you see it on the wall street show, you hang around him for a minute. You're like, this is a pretty hyped life, but at, at its essence, they're, they're very much family community and kind of the purity of the idea um, that's what they're, that's what they're anchored to. And that's what they're committed to. And so they had this name, this municipal concept, and they were thinking of like municipal courts, municipal courses, municipal, um, you know, the blacktop where there's a real, there's a real egalitarian vibe about that. You know, like it doesn't matter if you're the richest kid or the poorest kid, when the ball gets thrown on the blacktop, it's it's kind of a meritocracy, and they they really liked they really liked that, and I love that too. So we were thinking about municipal was a name that we loved. We really we really didn't know what to do with that um, in terms of what the brand would be. And this was this went on for years, and I was I was happy as a clam at Calway, comfortable, loved the people I worked with, and then. 
And then ultimately we were, we were just like, let's go for it. Let's do this. Let's give it a real shot. And the, the thing that we really liked um, to answer, answer your question, Ryan, the, I could have just answered this in five seconds. So sorry, it took me five minutes, but wow, man, you're good. the thing that we loved is we liked putting a very meat and potatoes, no nonsense, no bullshit name on gear that was like, it's like pretty hyped. You know, we really thought that was a cool juxtaposition and a cool marriage that those two things don't really go together. And, um, and we, it really played up to the notion of what we're trying to do at municipal, which is we, we think of it as like, as like blue collar luxury almost, you know, like really no nonsense, but when you get our gear and you wear it, you're like, shit, this stuff is awesome. And I don't, really giving access to those kinds of things that people may not have access to that a t-shirt's not a t-shirt like it can be made better and it can be made to be your favorite thing in the closet this it's not meant to be some bullshit throwaway item and it means a lot to us and uh and that's that's kind of the way mark and and lev do all their all their movie projects all their entertainment it's certainly the way i'm wired to to bring real real excellence and real quality to people so that's, that was kind of it. And the beauty of a startup, you know, as opposed to a corporate world, we didn't have to go through 20 <laughs> different gates. To get like, approved. okay, well, this guy approved it or we mm, can't use that, you know. You we, approve it. Yeah, exactly. We're like, oh, we love that. Let's go. And I think that um, this, something I'd really learned like very early is, is when you're in a, in a start, you guys probably have seen this just starting your own business is, what you think it's going to be on day one is not what it is on day 21 or 31. It's certainly not what it is when you launch it officially. And it, and it definitely isn't here. We are now almost a year into having our, our business be live for people. It's, it's changed a lot. And, you know, we had, we had a lot of assumptions of what we thought would be cool, but ultimately the consumer has really told us, our fans, our early fans have told us like, oh, we love this, we love this. I, I'll give you an example of that is we thought as far as this, as far as like the blue collar luxury part of it, we thought that people were going to be digging kind of a, a toned down look to, to what we were trying to do. And it's actually been quite the opposite. People love the brand. Um, they, the things that are like the most heavily branded of ours have been by far and away people's favorite stuff. And we would, we didn't know that at the beginning. I mean, as a brand, as a brand person, that makes sense to me now looking back, oh, of course they want to identify with the brand. But we were, we were just had an assumption and, and pivoted off of that once, once the, sh the shit started flying. Your bass likes loud, right? I mean, that's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it makes it's great. Sense. I mean, it's, it's super cool for me early, like, you know, less than a year in to have, so many people already be a fans of what we're doing and what we're trying to convey about who we are and why we're doing what we're doing and and a real a real sincerity and and commitment to integrity and honesty and the product and the service and the the brand really you know that that's that's awesome i i wouldn't have i wouldn't have expected that to happen as fast as it has for us um honestly that's awesome that's awesome man so so you just said it you're you are about a year in now in regards to obviously the pandemic last year the craziness and we'll, we'll get into you know the the other guy backing out and then you had the episode especially yeah. where you and your wife are talking about coming and we'll get to that here in a little bit because that uh, ryan and i were you know the most relatable things on the planet especially you know him with courtney having that conversation and it's a conversation i would probably have with my girlfriend too mm -hmm. so a year in how just uh you know surprised are you with the reaction of municipal especially after a pandemic because i know in the last episode you talked about projections where it was like i think you were expecting like maybe 90 dollars per order and yeah. it was actually being 120 and i love the fact that you guys release like limited supplies too so it makes that demand that need there like shit, i better go ahead and get this shirt now because i don't know when the next time it's going to be out so there's also this very exciting factor 
um, to it. So, you know, just as far as a year in, like, how are you feeling just as far as the company goes, the staff, like everything just, you know, moving forward? I mean, a 10 out of 10. Yeah. Now, did I feel that way six months ago? Did I feel that way three months ago? Yes. I always believed in the vision and I still, you know, I'm always never lost any faith or confidence in the vision, but it takes, it just takes a fuckload of fortitude um, that, you know, I mentioned before when one of the, one of the main driving reasons of wanting to do this is to see if I have what it takes. Like, literally do I do not literally, not literally, I'm speaking metaphorically. <laughs> do I metaphorically have what it takes to stand on the edge, looking out into the abyss and know that I can survive it, you know, that however shitty it's going to be. Now, obviously I didn't know pandemic who did, but yeah. Um, however shitty it's going to be, however challenging it's going to be, however many obstacles get thrown my way and the team's way. Do I have what it takes as a leader? Do I have what it takes as a human being? Do I have what it takes as a friend, as a colleague, as a as a business person to navigate through those and lead a, a group of people through whatever that is to be to, to to achieve some level of success or in 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 our case for the past year survive it. Um, so from that from that standpoint, a ten out of ten. There were a lot of times. I think the show kind of shows it in a in a in a real honest way. There were a lot of times when I didn't know what that journey was going to feel like or look like. Um, I must have said a hundred times a day to myself, uh, you know, the road the road the road to success is not straight. <laughs> so <laughs> it does not go straight in any startup. Um, you know, you, you're not, you don't really know what to expect until you're into it. And you, I, I, I'm sort of one of those people that I, I like to seek counsel from a lot of, a lot of different folks. You know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, my curiosity and learning, I think are, are really core to, to me. And, you know, everyone kind of gave me advice along the way, but none of that even resonates really until you're in it. And it really challenged, really challenged me personally, because you're wrong a lot. <laughs> Even on stuff, on stuff that you usually think you're pretty right on, you know, like I, I've been managing or part of businesses that have had some level of predictability. If you ask me, like when I was at Callaway, and part of it because we had scale around us, you know, hey, what what do you think your revenues are going to be next quarter? We kind of knew within five or ten percent every time, or even right. down to the unit. How many how many drivers? Do you think we're going to sell in the first quarter? We kind of knew that. I had, we have no idea what you know. Rick, who's our our CFO here, um, we we always joke or I joke. I think I joke, and I think it's probably not very funny. So I hesitate to even say this, but <laughs> we always say our our uh, our favorite radio station is WTFK. Which whenever anybody says, "Hey, what what do you think we need to do? What do you think we're going to do in the fourth quarter this year?" It's like you're listening to WTFK, which is who the fuck knows? No one knows. How can you even predict? You can't predict something from zero. Right. So imagine that like during a pandemic, like it's like, I was just like, how, how are we going to get through this? How am I going to get through this? What are the things I really need to rely on? And what do I need to let go of that are going to arm me to, to manage this thing, this, this business and, Ultimately, in the show, showed it that we put a lot of a lot of our own, you know a lot of our own money into it. So, um, if it fails, you know we're if health and our health and 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 wellness is number one. But if it fails, that's that's going to be a problem. <laughs> wow. So we can't make it fail. So that that was kind of the other thing is is uh, I kept telling myself. Um, you know, really three things was one I mentioned. The other one was every problem has a solution if you work through it positively. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, I kept telling myself, stay positive, stay positive for the team, stay positive for my family, stay confident, stay optimistic. Right. Um, and then the, the other thing I kept telling myself and uh, my wife, and I actually said this again when we were watching the show, which we hadn't seen, we hadn't seen anything until it aired. And we said, you know, at the end of the day, 
um, no matter what, like we did sit on the sideline and wonder, we, we went for it. Yeah. And we still, still hold on to that. You know, we're definitely not out of the woods yet. There's a long sure. way to go. I'm really, I'm really happy that me and my wife and Mark, you know, this is like, this is the creed of Mark fucking Wahlberg and Steve Levinson is like, they go for it, man. They just go for it. They put it on the line and go for it. And sometimes they get knocked down and sometimes they don't. But usually as long as you're willing to take the punches and keep moving forward and being unstoppable, good shit happens. God, that, that's that's so true. Uh, Sabo, before we get back to you, just real quick. To me, honestly, and I think Wall Street showed this a lot. The camaraderie between the three of you is just fantastic. And I t- honestly believe it shines in the brand itself. And not just you three, but also your coworkers, your staff. Like, Rihanna, just talking to Rihanna last week and just how excited she is to work for your brand. And even just your advertising, like, it's so just 100% authentic. Like, it doesn't feel bought. Like, you just went out and paid some celebrity millions of dollars to to rock this shirt. I mean, I'm rocking the hat right now. I got a polo. I know. I love it. <laughs> um, fortunately, the polo's in, the, in the, uh, the, the hamper right now. But it really is the most comfortable stuff I've ever, ever worn. And it is like black top meets high society almost. And you're right. I, I love that you mentioned that earlier. Because on the black top, like everybody's equal. You, when you're playing games, you're playing sports. It doesn't matter if you're the richest of the rich or the poorest of the poor. Like you got to go out there and ball. And to me, like I don't know what it is. I, I put this stuff on, and it just it just feels amazing. It's one of those like if you if you if you look good, you feel good. That kind of thing. So uh, it's not really a question. It's just something I wanted to put out there and just say thank you for for this. And I guess please, I'm, Brian, I'm, please go on. <laughs> yeah, he he likes the clothes, Harry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, I, I love it. Now, I am curious, though, um, I so I first heard of this brand watching the TV show Ballers. So I was yeah. like, wow, what a cool name for a brand. And I didn't know that it eventually would become a real thing. Was that kind of the game plan in the first place was to be like, hey, we finally figured out a name. Here's what we're going to do. Even though we're not really ready to launch yet, we kind of want to give a sneak peek on Ballers. Like, was, was that part of, like, the, the planning of everything, or did that just kind of just fall in your lap? I think if we ever end up writing the book about Municipal, we will say that we totally planned it. It was all orchestrated. <laughs> it, it somewhat serendipitous. Uh, they had the name, and, and Lev wanted to write it into Ballers um, just because he thought the name was cool. And, you know, now if you think about what the brand was on the show, it's totally different than what we're doing. It was, a like, a true streetwear brand. Right. Um, with the script, you know, this, uh, the wow. cursive municipal. Um, but we, we weren't really thinking that'll be any sort of catalyst. We just thought uh, it's cool. And the, the, the thing that I think we really embrace. So I was, I was really happy to hear you say that is we're not really going to try to tie ourselves to anything that's t- t- fairly formulaic or conventional. Right. We want to do things our own way and do it because we think it's cool and we think that it's right and we think there's an inherent truth behind it um and at all times and you know if somebody who's like purely academic is going to tell us it's a bad bad idea then usually those are the things in my experience are the most disruptive and the things that are the coolest so we we didn't really plan it that way it just kind of worked out um and we haven't said anything about that link at all either you know so uh it's kind of a little easter egg so i'm glad that you saw that Oh yeah, yeah. Big. I'm sure it doesn't hurt that your business partner partner had a show with The Rock on it either. I, I know. <laughs> these, guys, these guys, it's so fun to hang out with these guys. I mean, you you we do have a great a great camaraderie and relationship. I mean, I've gone from honestly, you know, not knowing not knowing um, Lev too much beforehand, just through Mark to like I, I honestly consider him one of my closest friends, and he would. He slapped me for saying this, but like a real mentor to me, um, just his business acumen is razor sharp and his, what he, you can see it in what he creates, Yeah. but his, his ability to kind of have his ear to the, the railroad track of what's going on at a street level and what's cool and authentic and all the stuff we mentioned is, is really uh, pretty natural. It's, I've never been around anyone like that. And you know, you add Mark to the mix, who's really, you know, everyone knows Mark, but he's as true and genuine 
as it gets. And he has just a kinetic energy that just never wanes. And so it's been a, it's been a, a lot of fun, even through our dark periods to get through it. And even like that time at, um, uh, Ryan, you mentioned it when, when our, our, our other entity that was funding us pulled out at a really critical time in March of last year. Mm -hmm. um, and for people that haven't seen the Wall Street show, we in right in the middle of March, there, there were four entities that owned the business, me, Mark Lev, and in uh, this group that is a longtime partner of Mark's and they're still like really good friends of ours. Everyone was going through some crazy crisis and we were the only business that they had that was a uh, was a startup and hadn't ha had no revenues yet. So we were just luck of the draw, <laughs> you know, it's like, Hey, sorry, this is a lifeboat women and children first. Hey, we get it. So, um, I wasn't mad. They pulled out. I just immediately was like, shit, I've never gone through anything like this. But when I called Mark and Lev and Lev specifically, like, he was like, man, never like a pandemic, but do you know how many times we've had something like this happen? Like, we're going to figure this out. Don't, don't worry. It's, it's going to suck. I'm not going to lie. It's going to suck, but we are going to figure this out and we are going to get through it. And, uh, that was, that was so uplifting that he was, he, he was just to see him in action during like total crisis mode gives you a lot of confidence. So, okay. We're going to, we may not have the lifeboat, we're going to be grabbing on to, I'm speaking metaphorically here. We weren't really adrift at sea, but um, <laughs> we're going to grab onto a piece of lumber and we're going to figure out how to paddle on until either something saves us or we get to shore or who, who knows. So um, it's been, it to kind of get back to what you're saying, it, it has been great to work with these guys and um, you know, for, for I think um for two guys that have had so much success in entertainment, I've never in my role coming to it as a little bit of an outsider into their world. Mm -hmm. They've never ever treated me with as anything other than an equal. And it's been awesome. And just getting back to that municipal thing, like it doesn't matter what they're there. We're they've treated me like we're equals in this. And that that's made my life really great. <laughs> Yeah, but that Mark Wahlberg, man, that guy's a fucking ball buster, though, isn't he? Oh, my God. It's, it's relentless. It's fucking it's relentless. guy. I watch him, and I'm like, man, I, like, I, I'm, if I ever had a chance to meet him, like, what the fuck would he say to me? <laughs> like, so he's, a, quick, he's a ball buster, man. I love, like, um, I've had, you know, a couple of, a uh, few experiences along the way to just, like, sit there with his, with his crew or whoever else and just, just watching him. The real How Johnny drama. Is. Yeah, it's awesome. He's he's hilarious, and he play he gets to play roles like that from time to time, and those are always the ones that I think are my favorite ones. Yes, uh, but he's uh, yeah he's he's just a normal a normal guy that uh, you know he worked worked his ass off, reached a level of success, and doesn't doesn't take any doesn't take it for granted. And it's crazy. I said this to Archie, and I think it's relevant, you know, kind of to the point you were making. I mean, you could walk into a house, right? And you would have like a grandparent, a the the son or the daughter of the grandparent, and then the grandchild. And every person in that, I mean, Mark Wahlberg's been doing it for so long that every person could be a fan of him from a different stage in his career. And there's very few relevant I mean, he's still as relevant today as he's ever been. There's very few that maintain that relevancy and that longevity. 30 um, years. I mean, he just turned 50. I know. 30 years he's been doing this. I mean, I mean, the first time I heard, you know, the first time I knew who Mark Wahlberg was, he wasn't Mark Wahlberg. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. he was he was doing the good vibrations. I was in elementary school, right? But, you know, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, I was a Mark Wahlberg fan when I was nine, you yeah. know? So, yeah. <laughs> crazy all right so we talked kind of about everything around the show let's get a little bit more into the show i'm just curious about how mark and lev approached you you know the, the conversation what did that conversation look like harry we are gonna have cameras following you around 
for a docu series about Mark. Talk to me about that conversation, how you felt. And then, you know, maybe once you get into that, maybe your expectations versus reality on the final product. Well, they weren't, they weren't all that specific about what it was going to be, you know, early. They were just like, Hey, we're, we're doing this thing. It's with at that time, going back three years ago, two and a half years ago, HBO max, I, who knew what that was? Nobody knew what HBO max. Oh, it's this, it's an over the top thing with HBO max. And, you know, we don't really know what it's going to be yet. Just it's, you know, they kind of were laying the groundwork for what, uh, what the original concept was. I mean, it's such a, it's so fascinating to me how it's even the creation of that show is very similar to what's happened with municipal because what they thought it was going to be wasn't at all what it turned out to be. And so like, we're going to, we're, we're going to follow, it'll follow Mark around. It's kind of a follow doc. So I'm learning like, you know, I'm learning all this Hollywood stuff, follow doc. That's cool. I, I've assumed that's a following documentary. <laughs> you're going to follow Mark around. You're going to go do what, you know, Mark does. And I was thinking like the only thing I could think of that Mark had been in was Wahlburgers, which was sort of, you know, a comedy almost, you know, it was really fun and um, showing his life and thought, okay, we'll be, we'll be a part of this maelstrom of Mark's world. Cause of again, showing that, that kinetic energy that Mark has. And uh and then when we started the business, they were like, yeah, we're going to, we'll have the crew come and they'll, they'll, they were not going to be invasive. Don't, don't worry. They're, they're you won't eat, you'll hardly notice that they're there. Um, and then the first, the first time they showed up, we noticed they were there. <laughs> there was, it was a big ass crew. I mean, it was, and you see that in the finished product. So I knew like immediately when I saw like the level that they were investing in this thing, that like, this wasn't just going to be some bullshit youtube thing you know like this is and not that i would have thought that of course they're not going to do that but it was legit and i knew enough to be dangerous to know the types of equipment they were using and getting to meet archie for the first time and the the showrunner and the producers that it was a legit high tone thing and so what i what i didn't really know was how where's the drama going to come from on a day-to-day -day basis. Cause on a macro level, like what we're doing is cool. Like here comes a startup. It's inherently risky as shit. It's in a pretty cool category. Everyone likes the fashion element. And of course with Mark wearing it, he, 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 uh, he loves that process. And so maybe that will be, that, uh, that will be something people will be interested in, but how the sausage gets made, um, isn't all that interesting. So where's the drama going to come from? And uh, well, we, we found out what the drama is going to come from. <laughs> Biggest drama ever. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. So like that, um, that, but ultimately I guess we, the, the crew became part of our family and our friends. And um, I think that there's, there's, su there were such pros about how they piece it together. And uh especially when you think about for f almost four months, they had real like very limited access to as a, as a team. So they had to figure out how can we do some of this stuff knowing that we have pretty significant COVID restrictions and, and, um, and how can we be there for it? So it was, uh, I mean, that's a story in and of itself that it should be told, like how did that show actually get made? <laughs> during this time we, so we don't want to get anyone in trouble either though <laughs> so. yeah exactly i mean there was talk about being unstoppable but how they got it made and how they kept true to the narrative under really tough circumstances and i didn't really know what to expect um all i kept saying and then you know for my wife to do it who is she doesn't want to be on camera <laughs> And uh, I just kept telling her, listen, it's in their best interest to not make us look stupid. <laughs> Let's have one of the most dramatic conversations of our life on camera. Can you believe it? I mean, it's like, <laughs> geez, like <laughs> yeah. I mean, 
it's amazing. But yeah, I mean, for her to do it, and I think um, that's our life lesson: is who we choose, who we choose to ride along with on our on our ride along with in life is the biggest decision we make. And uh, you know, my wife was steady as a rock. Yeah, and, man. Yeah, you know what? Who cares if we lose our house? We say, we, who cares? We'll live somewhere else. If we lose all of our investment, who cares? We'll go do something else. It's, well, it's, it's only seventy-two all- degrees, so you can just pitch a tent, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll go live on the. We'll go live in the van down by the ocean. Let me ask you a question. You know, I, I, Archie said this on the um, on the Wall Street post game podcast, and and it's true. And I'm not I'm not blowing smoke up your ass. Like Mark was obviously clearly the star of the show. And Archie called you second banana. I'm not going to call you second banana because that's not it. I mean, outside of Mark, you were the biggest, you probably got the most screen time. You were the second biggest star of that show. And that's what I was getting to with the expectations for reality. I mean, did you think that this was going to end up being almost like Mark Wahlberg and right under in, in subheading Harry Arnett? Is that what it said? Did it say go starring? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, it doesn't say let that. Let me stop you right there. Yeah, Mark is a star. <laughs> yeah, right. No, I had no idea. I had no idea. And because Mark is involved in so many things and so many cool businesses. I think, I think it, it you know, just the, 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 the ball bounced our way as far as municipal and the narrative. And I think that it just so happened that drama that affected us they felt like would really would really play well in the format that they were shooting. And um, I think that, you know, I, as I told my neighbor who watched it, she came over, she's like, I had no idea any of this was going on. You know, I was like, hey, I'm glad that Kim and, and my wife, Kim, I'm glad that Kim and I's financial, uh, uh, virtual, almost financial collapse could play out in front of you in an entertaining way. I'm really pleased that that happened. Glad you're happy. (laughs) What you want you to do, put it on, hey, tune into HBO Max to see my demise. Exactly. (laughs) And uh, she was on on episode three at that time. And I said, well, spoiler alert, you know that we didn't collapse because I'm standing here right in front of you and we haven't had to sell our house. But I think that people, to answer your question, I think that, I think that people really, um, our story really resonated with people because the the stakes were really high for us professionally and personally. And I and I say all this understanding there were far more people out there that the stakes, you know, they paid the ultimate price that we didn't have to. So I, you know, I'm not saying that insensitively. I sure I I know that, but yeah. that our everybody who you know other than the one percenters were facing some version of losing their jobs, losing their livelihoods, not knowing whether they, what, what was going to happen um, from one day to the next. And I think that, uh, I think that the, the filmmakers, the, the producers of it captured the rawness of that period really well. And the, both the fear and the, um, I think that we as a team for municipal team and, and Mark and Lev too, we were, we were maintaining optimism. We were optimistic. Yeah. We weren't positive all the time. You know, being optimistic doesn't mean you're a cheerleader. It means you're facing, you're facing the reality of the situation and having confidence that you're going to get through it. I think they captured that, that we were still confident, just it was different. And I think, what also resonated for a lot of people, and it should, is um, is that you know, aside from health, a lot of the fears that we that we hold on to and hold us back, that we build them up to be bigger than they actually are when you're in it. And uh, I've gotten a lot of people just reaching out, you know, on sliding into my DMs on uh, Instagram that have kind of said that that it really gave them a lot of hope for the future, for whatever they wanted to do that like it can be done. And like, here's a group of people that went for it. And, uh, and in the, in the biggest crisis we can all imagine that we, we are still here and we're still, we're still kicking, we're still alive and kicking. 
And I think the people that put the show together really captured that in a really, in a really, you know, dramatic raw way that was, that was uh, really resonated with people. And I did, I, I, I had no idea other than I knew these guys are, these folks are professionals and this is what they do, but I didn't realize the finished product would be so dramatic. I just didn't realize that. I thought that it would have, I thought that it would have some, uh, I thought it would have, I thought it would err more on the side of entertainment if you get my will, you know. It was entertaining, but it certainly yeah. was dramatic as well. Yeah, I, I thought that they would, I thought that it would have, uh, it would lose some of the truth to it. Just, I, I had no reason to think that, just my perceptions of how this shit gets done, you know. And, but you're just uh, very you know. relatable, you know, the life, you know, your story, for any entrepreneurs, I mean, everybody knows an entrepreneur. It's very relatable. So it's like, yeah, you get behind you, Harry. I mean, people were rooting for you. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, not TMI. Don't stop I'm, now. I'm, I'm, Why are you saying it? I'm, well, I'm laying in my bed with my <laughs> with my longtime girlfriend, and we're watching this conversation between you and your wife. And I and we pause it, and I look at her. I'm like, this is this is fucking us right here. This is the conversation that every family that get, that becomes gets into some sort of entrepreneurial they have to have at some point in time yours just you happened when you were taking your biggest gamble you know yeah. what i mean it was i mean harry man i, I just I, I know i said it already it's just this you 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 are so relatable your situation was so uh it hit home for for a lot of people and people fucking root for you man like yeah. people root for you and from the show i think you know like what's what what's harry got coming in season two you know what i mean i mean obviously <laughs> there's gonna have to be different drama and different storylines i mean now you guys probably got to worry about inventory and scalability and and resources people all those kind of things but i mean we're here for it man oh it's great yeah um don't worry season two i'm sure there's there are a thousand things that I can fuck up. So stay tuned, <laughs> but it's we'll stop uh, rooting for you. The growing, yeah. The growing pains are a lot more fun than the shrinking pains. Definitely. As we go, as we go forward and, um, you know, who knows? I know, I know the things that we have working that are just a part of our normal growth plan. Now that we, we, we've gotten through this period of, shaky and you know cash position and stuff it's not sexy but it's real um into where we're we're really starting about thinking about the next stage of growth and our our desire like when we first did this irrespective of wall street was to have an unheard of level of transparency for a brand that had people good bad or indifferent feeling like they were a part of our brand from the very beginning and whether they liked our products or not, they, we thought it would be cool that, you know, 10 years down the road that they could say, I remember when those fuckers were starting and they had, they were working out of a, a thousand square foot like barn, which is basically what we're working out of. And now look at them, they're, they're working out of a 2000 square foot barn. No, but whatever it is, you know, we, we thought that would be really cool. And we haven't even started really like the parts that get me jazzed up about providing real uh, connection and and um, education about what it, what have we learned along the way that can really help whoever wants to learn about it do whatever it is they want to do, and that's that's a major part of like Mark and Lev's vision for how they want to spend the rest of their lives is is helping others get out of or get moving or get unstuck or achieve whatever the best versions of them of their selves uh happens to be by you know not just because we make cool shit but because we have we have lessons that we've learned along the way that we want to share and um, we haven't even begun to do that because we've been stuck here in stupid fucking pandemic. <laughs> Ain't that. We had all these cool ideas for like what we want to do. And it's like, so all that stuff's coming. So that'll probably be part of season two or three or four. And we hope, uh, 
we hope that people we hope that people have the similar reaction you did, Ryan, which is like, hey, these are these are real people that are trying to do honest work and they're trying to make make life a little more fun and a little better for the people that are part of a part of their community. And and um, you know, we haven't we haven't really started to to do much of that outside of just what what we're what we've done so far. Gotcha. Gotcha. We've been a little busy trying to survive. All right. Cut us some slack. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I can't say in regards to just wall street real quick, it is to us very easily relatable. It's a good fun watch. They're 30, you know, 25 minute episodes to where you see the ups, you see the downs and, you know, Harry, I love your, your backstory, to be honest with you, just kind of like how you were in disarray and didn't know what you were doing. I didn't know what I was doing for half my life besides just bartending. Like I'm, I just turned 40 right. and I'm still trying to get my shit together. So it's inspiration to people that are like, Oh, well, when I hit 22, I need to be here. When I hit 25, I need to do this. No, just try to find your way, make your path and be happy and just try to do well with others. So, and just watching you guys and Archie and all those stories and how, you're right. I mean, the editing is just so fantastic and how they tie all that in with, of course, the drama of, the biggest drama of them all, the pandemic that shut the whole country down and how everybody stood together. You know, it was great seeing Mark check in with you, check in with Lev, like check in with everybody, make sure like that camaraderie, that's, that's, you can't fake that, you know, playing. No, I mean, right in the middle of it, I, there was one moment. Um, it's not in the show cause we weren't, there was no filming going on, but Mark called and was like, Hey, why don't you just come up? Um, and, uh, you know, have, we'll, we'll get some dinner. It was right there in the unrealistic offices gets, we'll have some dinner brought in and we'll just hang out. I was like, I, a, I need to get the hell out of the house. So yes, <laughs> yes. I would love that. And we went, uh, we went and hung out. He had dinner brought in. You didn't have to do that. Brought dinner in. And then, um, this was the coolest part. I don't think he'd mind me saying this, uh, but he had, because it was COVID, and Mark, uh, Mark likes to drink good wine. He had like really expensive wine brought in. There were probably 15 of us maybe at this thing. And we all got our own individual bottle of like probably the most expensive wine I'd ever had in my life. <laughs> and it was funny, he brought this thing out like, wait, we all get our own bottles. Like, yeah, COVID man, you can't share that thing. I'm like, that is awesome. <laughs> That is awesome. Mark's exactly like the type of person you would want to you would want to be if like you really made it, you know. Just yeah. like he never forgets Fuck yeah. the people around him, and he never forgets that it it has he's done a lot on his own, but it has taken a real team. And you see, I mean, you see that he's got the people that are with him, been with him forever, and um, you know, and that's that that part's been awesome. But what you said, Brian, is I think another podcast for another time but it's the single biggest takeaway at you know mark and i are almost exact same age that i've had in my career is that nobody's timeline can be used as a template for whatever you're wanting to do it, it has to be it's yours yep. and there's never your time's never up the best is always in front of you if you care to look at it that way mark looks at it that way but uh, it took me a long time to kind of figure that shit out. You know, that's why I avoided going to high school and college reunions forever. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to hear about the successful guy at 30. Fuck off, man. Now you don't have to go. Everybody knows what you're doing. Yeah. Ryan, yeah. Ryan, before we get to you real quick, I, I do want to hit on a hard hitting question here. So now this is the 60 minutes part of it. Between yeah. you and Mark, who is the better golfer? <laughs> <laughs> For the fans. Uh, uh, well, I have an easy way to answer that. If we play the way I play, uh -huh. I would beat Mark. <laughs> so if, what, if I have to play the way he plays, he would beat me easily because the way he plays is he plays like borderline speed golf. Mm. Um, you're running. I mean, he, he'll play 18, 18 holes in, in an hour and a half. Oh, so he has so, 45 is a golf course. Oh, yeah. So he, he, <laughs> he, would, he would beat me pretty easily because I would be out of gas on the, set, on the back nine. If we played the way I play, which is like the normal, normal human being way that aren't fit like him, I think I'd probably beat him. I'd probably given him maybe three or four shots. No oh, good. But, uh, but he's where he, I say that, and I've been around 
I mean, you, you kind of probably know this about him just because he's so successful, but he's one of the most competitive people I've ever, I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. He's like super, you know, relentlessly competitive. Mm-hmm. Um, so he, I'd say that, and if he hears this, he'd be like, you got no chance of beating me because I'm most, I'm more competitive than you are. And he probably is. <laughs> most successful people are. That's yeah. what dri- that, that competitiveness is what drives them. Relentlessly competitive, you know. I got one for you. This is this is beer, and this is my last question, Harry. Man, where the fuck is the M dot hat at, man? Like, you want that thing? I fucking want that. You want hat that thing? So bad. I was, was telling Rihanna bag. last week. I'm like, I'm watching. That's the hat that brought when I'm watching Wall Street. That's the hat that took me to the municipal website. Really? And I'm, like oh fuck they must be well Wahlberg's wearing it in every fucking scene for I know I have a funny story about that yeah that was early we hadn't even launched yet we had just a bunch of like concepts and that was a kind of a branding identity that uh our team here is really good and they were like this thing you know and they had it there's there's reasons behind it it had a um it really was I don't think I don't know if anybody cares about this shit but we were we were really vibing on kind of city symbols and you know subway symbols and like it was it's even in kind of like a subway font you may not even no i did this is shit you do early in a brand when you're like that's so cool and then no one cares but anyway um so we had like a bunch of the stuff that we had made just like trying it out see how it looks and i didn't even really mean to have that with me when i went up to marks this was a year ago at least we hadn't launched and i had all these hats and we weren't really planning on doing that one. It was just in there. And Mark's like, oh, puts it on. And the rest of it, yeah. So we haven't done it yet, but maybe we should now. I want that head, Harry. That. Okay. I want that head. Like, I, I was telling Rihanna last week, I'm like, I, I I want that fucking head. I know that the one the one he was wearing was sort of a blue camo, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I feel like, like, I feel like if you did sort of like a marled, like a black or a marled, like that would be I, I would i would buy that hat in a fucking heartbeat for, all for right. what it's worth harry i'm gonna go, no more. I'm gonna go ahead and tell you now this i i know that we're just kind of like you're you're one of the mill podcasts here this speaks volumes because the only thing this dude wears on his head involves the city of cleveland so i would wear that hat. to wear that hat is unprecedented <laughs> and there. harry i have like no bull i have like 50 different Cleveland hats, whether it's Browns, Cavs, Indians. And that would be the only hat that I own that is not city of Cleveland. And I would rock that fucking thing all the time. You won't even rock our own podcast hats. And I'm like, it's free. I got it made. He's like, no, I'm good. I love it. Now that, now that the the Cleveland team, well, not the Cavs, sorry. But now that like the Browns are getting good again, people are going to think you're a bandwagger bandwagoner when they see they you. won't harry anybody that knows me <laughs> i mean I, look, I got a picture of baker mayfield right here i got jim brown right anybody that knows me they know it, it ain't no bandwagon no it's been- funny uh there was a rumor because the indians are changing their name which of course you yes know, mm-hmm. there yeah. was a rumor that one of the names that they were considering and maybe still are is the cleveland municipals How about that municipals is one How about that yeah so Woo! i'll give you i'll give you a little background there harry you know, so, do you have insider info do you know what it's going to be not, not really but so the, one of the reasons behind that is the, the 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 lot that everybody goes to and tailgates before the browns games is the muni lot it's the municipal lot and it's right down on the lake shore and, and it's, you know, going to the Muni lot this weekend, yeah. going to the Muni lot this weekend. So I think that's sort of feeding into it a little bit. The other one that they're really big on is the spiders, which is their original Spider, yeah. name. And then the third one is the guardians and sort of the nerd in me, the pop culture podcast guardians of the galaxy. I, I really like that one, but I think municipals and spiders are the front runners and, and you may, you may have it. Well, we have the license and they have, or the trademark, they haven't reached out to us yet. So we'll see I, if they do, we'll do something where we trade it out for like lifetime season tickets to all Cleveland municipals games. And it's beautiful, beautiful I'll, ball I'll your way. I was going to say then you then you make the most comfortable baseball jerseys on the planet because we all know baseball jerseys are not that comfortable. 
So you guys do that. You might take over the whole fucking sport. Could be. This could be it. And then, yeah, and then, uh, and then we'll, buy, here first. we'll buy them. We'll buy the baseball team. And then we can. Uh... <laughs> They're going to be selling them soon. I'll tell you that. So you, yeah. you, it's all fun. We'll be right mind, there. Right? We'll be right there. Hello. There you go. Uh, uh, real quick, Harry, again, we, we thank you so much for joining us today. I do want to just uh, get some feedback on your Municipal Heroes program. I, I think it's yeah. just fantastic that you guys have started this for all military, medical providers, first responders, government employees, and the fact that it's a permanent 20% discount is unprecedented. You've seen a lot of people do it during the pandemic. A lot of people kind of do it a little bit after, but the fact that you guys are doing that moving forward where did that idea kind of come from? And and to me, you know, thank you, because my brother-in-law is a, a firefighter. He is a first yeah. responder, and I have other first responders in my family as well. So, I mean, to me, this is just fantastic. But what kind of drove that? Was it obviously the, the pandemic, and how did that all come about? Yeah, even bef- uh, going back, we just we always wanted Municipal to be, again, a, a, a brand for the people. And for the people that inspire us the most and for the people that always put um, their communities ahead of whatever it is they're doing. And, uh, and you know, the first responders, um, community heroes is what we call it. Those were the people that we wanted this brand to be for. And um, our stuff is pretty premium. And so we, we never wanted people that we respected and, and, and admired the most to ever feel like they couldn't have our brand. <laughs> So, um, and, you know, during the pandemic, it was even, you know, more obvious to us that we, we really wanted to make sure that the, the folks that were on the front lines doing this shit all the time with little fanfare knew that they were not only respected, but we were thinking about them and, and, you know, 20% off always, as you said, always on anything all the time. So, um, and we have, uh, or I, I have personally, it's just worked out this way. It's weird. The last uh, 15 years, I've always lived next door to a firefighter. And I'm like, they got the coolest jobs. They're the coolest people. So uh, I, I dug that my neighbor is always wearing municipal and his firehouse is wearing municipal. And that, that and you know, Mark, Mark's connection to the military mm-hmm. is well known. So we, we really wanted municipal to be the type of brand that um, represented those people well. Love it. Absolutely it's awesome. Love it. Uh, For those of us that don't put on our, our lives on the line. <laughs> yeah, the right. right. I mean, like I said, it's so great that that's a permanent discount too. You know, oh, I, yeah. I did think it was cool when companies did that last year, but the fact that you do that 24, seven, 365, again, speaks volumes to the brand. Doctors, nurses, anybody that is putting their life on the line and on the front lines, we, we, you know, it's the least we can do. It's amazing. Yeah. So, so, one of my last questions, and this is just, you know, the fans want to know, I want to know, obviously hanging around with Mark and, and some celebrities out there. If, if you were a movie star, what kind of films do you think that you would be in? Would it be like rom-coms? Would it be comedies? Would it be action films? Like if Harry, you're the star, what, what kind of films do you think that you would like thoroughly, thoroughly love to be in? I think it would have to be comedy. Look at my face. So I'm not, it's not going to be, uh, I'm not going to be an action hero and um, I'm not going to be a matinee idol. So I better, I better make, I better make my living by being funny. <laughs> Definitely. If it's not, uh, if it's not reality, which that's the only thing I've ever actually been in is, is Wall Street. So. <laughs> and, and last but not least too, big fans of 15 minute mentor. Do we got more of those episodes coming out? Yeah. What's the, what's the low now with that? Let everybody out there know what's going on. Well, AJ's listening to this, who works with me. It's as fast as he can produce them. So we have a bunch in the can. We have six that we made originally. And, um, you know, that's kind of a little taste of what we want to be doing, which is it's short. It's yeah. only 15 minutes. It's not that much Perfect. time. Yeah, it's not a huge time commitment. And we we hope that that people will listen to it and get a little something out of it. So um, thanks for mentioning that. Cause yeah. Um, we're just, we just started it a couple months ago and, uh, we'll end up doing probably dropping one a week forever. Yeah. It, I forever mean, it's and genius. Ever. I mean, it, the, you know, that's a normal commute to work for most people that are still going to the office and you were doing one at, when you were at Callaway. So it's yeah. not like you're a stranger to the podcasting world. 
So, uh, you know, to me, I think when we were at Callaway, we were the first brand to have a podcast, you know, back in the dark ages of podcasting, which was like 2011, first brand right. to do that. But it was, it was just um, you guys and Joe Rogan. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How's he doing? Is Has anybody heard from him? What's he up to? <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, so we really believe really strongly in that is is telling the, you know, providing something to people through media. And um, you'll see more and more and more of that kind of stuff coming from us as we grow. Awesome. Awesome. Saba, anything else, bud? No, man, I'm good. I got to <laughs> get going. Apparently, I got to get going on getting that M. hat to market and get. I'm it. telling you, man. <laughs> I'm telling you. Well, listen, I'll go ahead. Maybe we'll do a little off. orange and brown one with an M dot for you. So that you can I'll, buy, I'll buy them all, Harry. All the colorways. <laughs> I'm not a camo guy, so I won't go camo. But we'll anything, camo. Sol we'll anything solid, we're black, good. Orange and brown. I love right. the color. Okay. Nah, just everything about the brand. I know I know. Behern's trying to wrap up. But oh, no, 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 I'm not wrapping good, up. I'm just gonna I know you just gave me a good opportunity. You know, the 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 colors, the colorways. I mean, you guys are, are very unconventional. You know, there was the the scene in Wall in Wall Street when Mark's like, you know, we used to do fucking gray or whatever, right? You know, yeah. it's just, uh, you know, I, I feel like uh, you guys really hit the mark, and you know, for, for for what it's worth, voice a customer here. You guys got some really cool shit. I'll tell and, them, uh, Mark. You're on Mark the right has way. probably said to me, no exaggeration, one billion times. Okay, I was exaggerating. It hasn't been one billion times, but. <laughs> maybe a hundred don't be afraid of color harry do not be afraid of color i'm like okay i hear you Look and at i me. love I'm what pataya. i'm wearing pataya today yeah. and i love what you guys you are doing the, the the periwinkle color um like probably blue. not periwinkle but you know it's that blue the, yeah, yeah so the that's, a good, that's a good thing to end on a little wonky but we we really want to make it easy for people to look cool and not, you know, not feel like they have to think too much about does this match does that match literally everything that we make goes with everything else. So you can kind of geranimal it if you really wanted to, but if you buy a t-shirt, you know, it's going to go with whatever pan or short that we make and you can do it super hyped like Mark. I mean, Mark will wear lilac with, with, you know, uh, jungle camo, pants and he was like holy shit that's cool can i do that well yeah of course you can if you want to some people that may be too hyped you don't really want it do you really want to be that noticed when you go to the coffee shop well i kind of do now you know what I mean? more patterns coming i know you more, know obviously yeah, outside of the camo you got the um like the flowers Marvel you did, the, yeah you, know, you did the t -shirt. Got a whole bunch of shit coming yeah, yeah that's it's awesome that's awesome that's the other thing too that you mentioned and we talked about before we are like, okay, that'll be a little bit of what we do. People have gone crazy for it, you know? It's because it's so wearable, um, even for me. Like, would you have told me a year ago that one of my favorite pieces would be a floral t-shirt? I'd be like, probably, I'm not probably going to wear that, I don't think. And it's like one of my favorite pieces, too. That's the thing. You see somebody like Mark wear it, and he pulls it off so well. And I'm just like, I've never thought about wearing a shirt like this before, but I'm, I may fucking try now. Right? And that's right. It looks so cool. And on top of that, you guys have it in, in a limited quality too, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's yeah. what Anna said. So it is one mm -hmm. of those things where it's like, if I want to get involved with this, I need to go ahead and get it now because I don't know when they're going to act it. now. You must act now. Don't sleep on it. Go. 1 800 municipal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Operators are standing by. Let's go. Yeah.